thank you to everybody who's joining us. Uh, welcome, and uh, we're excited to spend the next hour with you to talk about um, what's in your cannabis vapor. Uh, just to start, just give you a general overview of, of, our, of our business and who we are. Labstat, LabSmart are part of the certified group. We are um, an American and Canadian based uh, group of companies that specialize um, in testing, analytical chemistry, as well as in vitro toxicology. Uh, with that, could you go to the next slide, please? So just give you a little bit of a background on the Labstat side of the business. So Labstat is um, the largest analytical chemistry and in vitro toxicology um, testing lab that specializes in vape products heat not burn products. So vape products being cannabis as well as on the uh, uh, nicotine side, but also heat not burn products. We call them new generation products as well as tobacco products. Uh, we have uh, four laboratories. We are located in both uh, the East and the West that gives you a full complement of labs. Uh, we also, in terms of geography, we're an ISO 17025 accredited lab. We also are compliant to FDA 21 CFR part 11 and part 58. Uh, we also conduct um, toxicology work under OECD guidelines as well, just in case there's, uh, there's any concern about the way in which we conduct our assays. Just to make sure that we don't leave anybody out or anybody who's listening, make sure that they don't uh, have a concern about whether or not they should be here. We're actually gonna talk about vapor in, um, in products from pretty much cradle to grave. So everything from early R&D, regulatory type testing that may have to be done before you can market your product, um, all the way to post surveillance. So once your product is in the market. So we're gonna cover anybody who's looking at R&D, anybody who's looking for regulatory compliance work or just better understanding their product already in the market um, we will um, address all of you. So essentially, we're, we're going to talk today about really two issues and answer two questions. The first, the first and, and most prevalent um, um, issue that we've noticed in um, the cannabis vape side is that in most cases, or in many cases anyways, there's always this concern from the consumer about quality and safety of the products. And of course, the real question is, is, well, how do I address those issues? So we're going to talk about that. But the other thing, question that we're going to uh, try and answer, and we're going to talk about in terms of an issue, is we're going to also talk about how the product is performing in terms of consumer experience, so deliveries. And we'll explain deliveries in a little more detail in a moment. But layman's terms, really, really what it means is, is the product delivering what it was expected to, whether it be CBD, THC, both. We're going to begin to answer questions about the chemical safety of the product. We're also going to talk about, not just about safety items, but also solutions to answer those questions. We'll also give you a better idea of the analysis of e-liquid versus, or sorry, of oil versus vapor and why they're different and why there is an advantage to doing both. And of course, we're also going to again, provide you with solutions that are cost effective so that you can begin to evaluate the safety and the quality of your product. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, when we started looking at the market itself and started to understand the vape market the way all of you do when you're marketing your products, one thing um, stood out uh, very clearly to us as we did our research and that there's a clear need or a clear request from consumers to better understand or feel comfortable with the safety of the products. So, so safety and quality will we'll link together, but they're, they're, they're quite concerned about exactly what they're vaping. Our biggest dilemma at this point in time is there are really no standards. Um, we know that Health Canada has oversight for this product line, but they haven't been prescriptive in the way in which they'd like to see safety data, if you will, from a chemical perspective on vape products. So the rest of this presentation will actually talk about the solution. So what we can do to mitigate our risk, to better understand the safety and the quality of our products. At the end of the day, 
the most important thing that we can communicate when it comes to safety is that we've done our due diligence to demonstrate that our brand is both a quality product and a safe product. In this presentation, we're going to talk about specific vapor and oil analyses that will help you better understand your product and begin to be able to communicate to your consumer base the safety of your product. Over many years, uh, LabStat has developed a series of methods that are used in the vape industry. These methods are interchangeable, meaning they can be used for nicotine vape as well as cannabis vape. And so what we began to do was we began to use our methods to better understand the quality and the safety of a cannabis vaped product. And essentially our, the background, if you will, the key drivers, the guiding principles behind our testing protocols for the vape industry was it had to be science-based. So the methods that we are using are methods that are recognized by regulatory authorities around the world. And for that reason, they, they recognize the, the, um, the, um, the quality of the method because they're both robust and reliable and they've been put through what we would call a stringent validation process. So with that in mind, you would have confidence in using the methods that we're going to discuss. When we talk about um, liquid testing and aerosol testing, they're very, very different. So allow me just to take a few moments to explain the difference. When you're analyzing a liquid or an oil, you are not analyzing it in a vapor state. And that is very, very different. Regulators look at both the aerosol and the liquid separately. And the reason why they do that is because the chemistries can change when you heat up an oil. And when you heat up an oil to con and create an aerosol, you can then evaluate the compounds that are found in that aerosol. And there's no other way of doing that than actually vaping the product. So as we go through this, this discussion, we will point this out a few times that testing an oil or heating an oil up and in a, in, a, in a specific type of heating device that is not a vape device, cooling the liquid and testing the liquid is not testing the liquid as a vapor. You're testing the liquid that's been heated up and cooled down. What we talk about when we talk about vapor is actually puffing the device, collecting the aerosol, analyzing that aerosol for specific compounds of interest. That is completely different than analyzing an oil. Analyzing an oil, again, is different than analyzing um, an aerosol. Next slide, please. So when we look at how we would go about doing the actual testing so that you can start to understand and evaluate the safety and quality of your product, we wanted to take a very phased approach. And we took this phased approach for two reasons. The first one, one of the most, or the most important one is cost effectiveness. So in other words, what we wanna do is we wanna learn something about the device and the aerosol. And if for whatever reason it doesn't pass or we need to go back and we need to tweak something, we don't go through three or four different phases to figure this out. We do it one step at a time. So we will always start with the device performance, which we'll explain in a moment, but top line, we're just trying to understand whether or not the device is actually producing the correct amount of aerosol based on the uh, device requirements or expectations. Then we'll actually look thereafter at how the dosing is occurring. So how much CBD, how much THC are we seeing in the aerosol on a puff by puff basis or on a block of puffs basis so that we can understand whether or not it's the THC goes up over time, goes down over time, whether it's consistent over time. And then the third part is whether or not we're seeing additional harmful compounds that may be of concern to yourself and your consumer. So with that in mind, I'm gonna um, ask Peter Joza 
to um, um, provide you with um, an under understanding, a better understanding of each part of this phased approach. So phases one through three, so that you have a better understanding of how this approach will help you better understand the safety, um, the safety profile of your product. Welcome everyone. So uh, now we're gonna get into the really the fun part of the presentation, which is really the science of vaping. So when we're talking about device performance in phase one, we're looking at conducting the simplest test to see whether the device and the liquid combination are working properly. So basically that becomes your smallest investment to determine how well your liquid and your device are harmonized before going down a path of complex analysis uh, that is going to be uh, much more um, costly. So we're looking at just simply applying specific conditions uh, to the device and liquid in order to evaluate whether the liquid is performing properly in the device, simply because we know that there's a lot of device to, uh, to device variability, which can lead to extreme differences in performance. And we want to be able to generate meaningful results. So in general, when we're looking at uh, aerosol generation and using a device, we're looking at how a puff occurs. So we're looking at the volume of a puff. So how much draw is taken through the device, how long that draw is, which is the puff duration, and what is the frequency. So how much time between puffs are taken. And these are simply three examples of different puffing regimes that are have been applied uh, globally. The middle one, the Caresta regime, is one that is a standard regime that's applied to e-vapor products for nicotine delivery systems. And that becomes important because eventually, because those products are already regulated in different parts of the world. And eventually there will be a comparison made to e-liquid nicotine containing devices and vapor devices uh, in the cannabis industry. So when we look at the challenges that we have uh, for vape testing, we've got things where we've got extreme variability between vapor systems and devices with multiple puffing regimes that can be tested. So we've got the harmonization that's necessary between the liquids and the devices. So it may be a device may work perfectly well with one liquid and not well with another. And conversely, a device or a liquid that it works very well in one of these devices is leaks uh, terribly through another device. So phase one attempts to mitigate some of the challenges related to the device liquid harmonization or compatibility. And that harmonization and compatibility is necessary for people to yield, to generate any meaningful results with uh, the emissions analysis. Three, points three and four on, on this slide uh, are additional challenges when we get into the more complex analyses. So in many cases, we're looking for uh, yields that can be very small on a puff by puff basis. And in other cases, we may be looking for trace contaminants that are inherent to the environment where we need to avoid those levels of contamination. All of these are important to generate meaningful uh, results. 
current regulations, or at least in the Canadian uh, regulations, as a minimum, have a requirement for the analysis of the oil. Uh, however, we know as regulations mature or evolve, and we know that they eventually will, the emissions, which are inevitably uh, what the consumer is exposed to, uh, analysis of those will become necessary. So as part of good product stewardship, we want to address those concerns in advance of any regulatory requirement. And then that enables uh, you uh, as a uh, customer to understand the potential consequences of any regulatory uh, issues coming down the, the line uh, for emissions. Phase one, two, and three, when we're starting to look at uh, the emissions of analyses, we're looking at a series of different types of compounds that are uh, maybe necessary to be tested um, in the emissions. So our phase two is really our dose delivery uh, section. So consumers, they're will expect to have a consistent experience with their product. So be that from the effect of the product or the taste of the product that they're using. So dose consistency of the cannabinoids, which will relate to both the taste and effect and the dose consistency of the terpenes, which will definitely relate to the uh, taste of the product uh, are important to have an understanding because we know that all of these compounds that we're looking for have different boiling points. Um, so what the taste at the beginning of the initial puffs of usage versus the end puffs of usage can be quite different. So in order to assess potentially the highs and the lows of the delivery cycle, a device and an extract combination will be puffed under a prescribed regime, and that is built on from the knowledge gained in phase one of looking at the absolute deliveries of the device and performing tests for the cannabinoids and the terpenes in um, specified puff segments. So some devices with larger tank systems may have a total volume that would yield 300 puffs. So in order to understand the overall uh, dose delivery of that system, you may want to do specific segments of 50 puffs. So six collection segments of 50 puffs and evaluate what is the delivery in the first 50 puffs, the second 50 puffs, and so on and so forth, in order to understand it are, is my heating cycle on the device and is the liquid uh, performing properly in the device to give a consistent product or a consistent emission, which would yield a consistent experience. With these uh, dose uh, delivery considerations, uh, we want to look at the overall life of the, the product. So as I explained previously with that differential uh, distillation, uh, I'm trying to think of a, a good uh, example of basically you buy a loaf of bread the, the bread will taste different the first day versus the last day that you're eating the last bits of the bread. You're gonna get a different experience from that. The idea is, is when you're doing your product development is can I have a consistent delivery pattern or a consistent experience for my consumer? Having that consistent delivery pattern uh, will really by um, um, brand, in essence, brand loyalty. It's kind of like um, another example is when I buy beer. 
if my beer tastes different uh, from case to case, I will probably go to a different case of beer. At the completion of one and two, we do have a good assessment of is the device doing what it's supposed to be doing? Is it, am I delivering the appropriate amount of cannabinoids of what it was intended to do? Are we delivering the appropriate uh, or consistent terpene uh, profile based on the extract that I'm using? Moving on into phase three is where we start to look at the unintended consequences of vaping. So are we creating compounds of that may be either harmful or potentially harmful during the vaping process? At this point, there are no uh, current regulations for these harmful and potentially harmful con compounds related to cannabis vaping uh, products. However, if we look forward, one could um, assume that the regulations that are currently out there for electronic nicotine delivery systems could provide the framework for any uh, regulatory needs with respect to emissions for harmful and potentially uh, harmful compounds for cannabis products. One of the major uh, harmful and potentially harmful compounds that has been um, discussed is the heavy metals um, that can be emitted. So we're analyzing currently the extract or the liquid or oil for the metals, but during the heating process, certain devices can leach additional metals into the liquid, which would become atomized during heating. So uh, analysis of metals is uh, in general a, um, a high uh, compound of interest for uh, looking at cannabis products. And there has been some work already in the US from a regulatory standpoint uh, at the state level of looking at heavy metals in emissions. There's other harmful and potentially harmful uh, compounds that do not exist currently in the oil. So these are in essence decomposition products uh, which can be created. And some of these can be some of the carbonyls like formaldehyde or acrylin. So these are highly reactive compounds that having an understanding that does my liquid have some of these precursors that when my liquid is heated that I'm generating these devices or these compounds. The third aspect is looking for known adulterants. So 2019 was a big year for vitamin E acetate. Uh, so vitamin E acetate being used to, um, to really cut the, the oils or liquids. Vitamin E acetate on itself as a topical uh, ointment or anything is not harmful. Vitamin E acetate in the lungs can be uh, extremely detrimental. So these categories of um, harmful and potentially harmful compounds, as well as adulterants will always continue to evolve as certain uh, health effects are, are identified. Thanks, Pete. Just yeah. before we go on, that was a lot of information. And um, this might be a good time to just go back a little bit and talk about the premise here, because there's a lot to, there's a lot to absorb here. So 
we all we started with the premise and we hear from our clients on a daily basis that they want to understand a better way and a cheap, cheaper way of understanding specific analytical chemistry items that are related to safety. So Pete talked about metals. There are other things that we would also want, should consider when it comes to vaporized products. Um, formaldehyde, so carbonyls is, is one for sure, and potentially um, some others such as um, um, volatiles. But the point is, is that there's no framework out there to follow, no game plan to follow in order to determine what it is that you should A, be looking for, and B, what regulators would, would consider um, important constituents, um, toxic toxicant or toxic constituents to look at. So what we've done here is we've said, okay, let's take a different approach. That approach starts with, let's understand how the device delivers um, aerosol. Why is that important? Well, it's important because we see a lot of variability between devices and you understanding the quality of the vapor that's being produced is very important. So that's the first thing we do. We take that, we put it aside, we look at delivery. After that, we want to understand or we look at consistency of dosing. Then we want to look at delivery in terms of what it is that you want to deliver. So in your case, you want to deliver THC, CBD, both. So is it consist consistent throughout the cartridge, throughout the tank as it's being delivered to the customer? So these are qualitative things that you will want to know. So even before we get into safety, you're starting to get a qualitative understanding of how your device is performing. And if you compare it to some of your competitors, you might get a pretty good idea then of how yours is performing versus your competitors. And that will give you a very good piece of market understanding as you move forward as, and engage with your, your clients or your customers. Then there's the third part. So the third part is safety. And we all know that safety is important to everybody in this, in this space and rightfully so. So how do we address that? Well, we start looking for a specific compounds of interest, we call them, or harmful compounds. Metals are one of them. And so we look at metals, we can aerosolize the, the, um, the oil, we can collect that aerosol and we can find out and look for specific metals, the California metals list as an example, to ensure that you're in a range that is acceptable. So now you have this full package, if you will, of understanding quality, how am I delivering the dosing? How consistent is the aerosol? Then you get into safety. Okay, what's coming out of my aerosol? I wanna know certain compounds, and I've used metals, Peter has used metals as well. I've mentioned formaldehyde as well. These types of, these types of compounds can be analyzed in the aerosol. It's a stepped approach. And we're doing that because at any time, if you're not happy with what you're seeing in phase one, you don't jump to phase two or phase three until you're happy with phase one. There's no sense in spending money on a device that's not producing the type of, um, the type of aerosol uh, consistency that you expect. So as a result of that, we're trying to be cost effective. The other thing we're doing is we're being very, very focused. So we're looking, when we look at the harmful compounds, we're not looking at a wide range of compounds. We're looking at those that are of most interest in the industry right now. So that would be metals. Um, we would suggest that if you want to spend a little bit more money that you look at carbonyls, which are typically um, produced in a aerosolized type environment um, and potentially volatiles as well. But let's focus on metals. So then you get a metals profile, but this metals profile is coming from the aerosol. So if you can imagine, it's hard to imagine if you've never seen it before, but we have machines that actually puff the devices, take the aerosol, analyze that aerosol for metals. So we're not heating the, the, the oil up cooling it down and testing the, the, the liquid. We're literally testing the aerosol. And you might say, well, what's the difference between the two? Well, there's a significant difference between the two. And that is, is that regulators know the difference between heating something up and cooling it down and looking at the contents of an aerosol. And 
Health Canada is very, very familiar with it, as is FDA uh, in the states. And I would say most state governments are just as aware because there's enough publications out there for the regulators to understand the difference between heating an oil and aerosolizing an oil and testing the aerosol. So hopefully now you've got a better understanding of how the protocol works, how we're identifying specific protocols to look at qualitative issues in a device and in vapor, as well as a constituent or compound um, uh, production of these devices. So you've got this good feeling of how we're doing this. So now when we look at cost and, and you're looking specifically at what you should do next, you can look at it in, let's call it three buckets. So on the far left, you've got the Health Canada standards. So these are the standards that we know. It's for the most part, we're analyzing what's in the oil. And we know it's THC and CBD content, microbial contamination, heavy metals, pesticides, solvents, and so on. That's very clear that's mandated. But if you're, it's really not really explaining anything about the aerosol. So that's when we get into looking at phase two. And phase two is a more, is a more um, focused area on the aerosol. So we're looking at specific performance um, um, issues or performance items. We're checking the box phase one, phase two. We're looking at dosing. We're looking at aerosol production. And then we're getting into what you would call the harmful constituents. So now you've got a better understanding of your products. Now, at some point in time, and we don't know, we know in the United States for certain um, types of aerosolized consumables, there is a toxicology requirement, not just an analytical chemistry requirement on, on the aerosol, uh, on aerosolized products. So we can perform in vitro toxicology. Next slide, please. These are the toxicological assays that I'm speaking about are typical assays that are well known and understood by regulators. Those are the AIMS assay that looks at mutagenicity, neutral red that looks at cytotoxicity and micronucleus assay that looks at genotoxicity. So we can apply those specific assays, toxicological assays to both the vapor and the extracts to get an understanding of the biological effect that aerosol or the liquid for that matter, but we would be more interested, anybody on this call would be more interested on the aerosol side to understand exactly how aerosol is affecting these biological systems from the standpoint of mutation, cytotoxicity and genotoxicity. So when we look at, just to wrap things up, so when we look at how we're going to um, try and find a solution to better understand the quality of our products and our um, and the safety of our products in the vacuum in the vacuum that we have to deal with right now because there are no regulations, no guidances. We need to have a flexible approach, and this allows product developers, people who are preparing for um, potentially an engagement with a regulator to have a flexible way of presenting some data to give people some background in terms of safety profile and quality profile of the product is really a solution that allows you to start ticking off those, those, those boxes in terms of those questions. And so we're hoping that as we have, have um, presented this these protocols to you today, that you start thinking about how you can start looking at answering these safety questions. And certainly from the standpoint of engagement with us, we're, we, we're always here to help. And we're always here to talk to you about specific answers that you would like to, um, to or sorry, specific questions that you would like to answer so that we can you know help you meet those objectives. Next slide, please. So when we look at vape testing phases one, two, and three that Peter was explaining to you, there is a cost-effective approach that you can start with. 
And that is understanding the basic uh, THC, CBD content, microbial um, activity, the heavy metals, pesticide solvents, and vitamin E acetate in the extract. But then you can start looking at the vapor. And we suggest that you start with metals because we know that metals is a hot topic amongst regulators in the United States. And it's a hot topic with consumers as well. The amount that you would spend typically for something like this is approximately $3,500. So it's a really good start to answering those questions, a small price to pay for the quality of, um, the, quality of the answer that you're going to get. Well, I just want to reach out to anybody, see if they have any questions um, in reference to this presentation. So, so Nancy, I can explain a little bit more in the sense that uh, what is really important is analyzing the aerosol that is being generated as a combination of the liquid and the device. So the aerosol can be slightly different from similar devices due to different wicking ability in the device in the heating profile in the device. So using some sort of surrogate to generate an aerosol from that liquid will not generate the same type of aerosol as puffing it through that device. So those, that harmonization is very important um, in making a product that is suitable for specific devices. Thanks, thanks, Peter, for clarifying. Um, we got a question here. Um, how much would the testing for additional vapor compounds be for formaldehyde? Um, well, we could get back to you on that pricing, not a problem. Um, if you could reach out to our, our, our team here, and I'll just share the screen. <clears throat> <clears throat> Depending on where you're from, you can reach out to our team directly or uh, share your uh, email in the chat and I can reach out to you, not a problem. Are you able to test for specific temperatures? We do not test for specific temperature of the atomizer or the aerosol. Both of those would require some uh, deconstruction of the device. And those would again be surrogates because the temperature that is measured is already going to be changed by simply attempting to make that measurement. So for example, if you're using a, a thermal uh, type uh, system, uh, you're still measuring the outside of the device and not necessarily measuring the atomizer directly. And as soon as we insert a probe or a thermocouple into the device to specifically measure the atomizer, uh, in essence, what you are creating is another thermal sink. So you're actually changing what that temperature of the atomizer is. So, so we do not do that um, analysis. Thanks, Peter. Our next question is, what equipment is used to capture the vapor of analysis? Okay, so the equipment is different for different analytes that we're looking for. So for example, if we're simply measuring the device mass loss and the aerosol collected mass, that is collected on a glass fiber filter pad. And there's, we're using glass fiber filter pads, which are designed for nicotine delivery systems uh, to, to measure that mass. Now, we all know that the vapor is a combination of fine particles and gases. So the glass fiber filter pad will only collect the particles. The gases are routinely collected in a gas bubbling system. So uh, where the gas or the draw will uh, basically bubble through a solution, we call it an impinger, and it is trapped in that impinger. 
the solution that's in that impinger is going to be very specific for the analyses. So when we're looking at, say, our dicarbonyls, where we would collect formaldehyde, uh, that is using an acetonitrile impinger at minus, I believe, 50 degrees Celsius. It might be minus 35 degrees Celsius. If we're looking for volatiles, we're using an impinger with uh, methanol in it at minus 70 degrees Celsius. So the trapping system when it comes to aerosol needs to be specific to the compounds that we're looking for. Simply measuring the aerosol in on the particles itself um, you would give a misrepresentation of a majority of the light end terpenes in there, for example. <clears throat> Thanks, Peter. Um, we have a question here. What is the turnaround time uh, to have the test like this completed? Um, so I guess if you're referring to the last slide, um, which is the, the primer intro, um, our, our, um, our regulatory testing is a five-day turnaround time for the extract testing. And the metal vapor testing um, would probably take, uh, maybe Andrew, you can help on that, how long that would take typically takes between 15 and 20 working days. It could be faster, but we give you a standard just based on the amount of work that we're doing at the time, but it won't go beyond 20 working days. And that's generally going to be dependent on a combination of things. Really the scope of the work, if we're analyzing 10 different liquids using the same types of devices uh, times the three reps, and we only have five devices to work with. Uh, that makes all the tests need to be done sequentially. If we have um, basically what I would call an unlimited supply of devices, uh, then many of the tests can be done concurrently, which then shortens the timeline. timeline. Thanks, Peter. Um, next question we have, can you help with formulating recipes? I think we'd have to look at that in terms of, I think we need to get back to you on that in terms of our license. I know we've looked at this in the past. This was uh, over a year, year and a half ago. Um, it's something that we can talk about. Um, but at this point in time, I can't say yes or no. So I think we should take, take that person's um, addre email address so we can get back to them. If I may, Nancy, really quickly, something that Peter talked about a little bit earlier, actually it was just before, um, the turnaround time question. He was saying, you know, he was explaining how we, how we analyze or collect the vapor and analyze the vapor. I think there are two points that need to be um, very clear to the group. Um, and Peter, please chime in. Uh, the first one is that these types of methods are very well known throughout the world. So these aren't, we're not making these up. Um, these are actually well known. They're documented um, in the vape industry, if you will. And uh, Labstat is actually globally recognized for being able to do this type of work. Um, it, not just our ability to uh, collect the aerosol, but also to analyze it as well. So that's that's the that's the first thing. The second thing is is that with the the knowledge that's already out there, regulators at least in, in Europe, Canada, United States, I would really say most regulators around the world um, are very familiar with these processes. But here's the trick. The trick is, is that if you don't know how to do this properly, you will not get consistent results. And it usually takes a while before you can get very good at this. So this is an experience thing as much as it is an instrument thing. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, Andrew. Um, our other question is we have, do you test for the metals and the vapor for information only or are specifications based on inhalation limits in the USP EEP? During our method development, inhalation uh, toxicology limits are always considered uh, in order to be, to, to uh, look at what levels are, um, the method is capable of achieving. Now, that also takes into account a certain 
estimation of the amount of vapor that is expected to be um, delivered by the device and a cons what the expected consumer usage is. So for example, looking at electronic nicotine delivery systems, if a person is smoking a device that has 700 milligrams of uh, e-liquid in it, and the toxicologists have estimated that a person would use three cartomizers per day. So it's basically 2.1 grams of E vapor being uh, generated from those cartridges. Uh, then those would, those numbers would be assessed against the, say the 50 puff collection that may only have 300 milligrams to see if any of those levels are being exceeded. But since each product itself may have a different usage pattern, that requires the additional calculations from the methodologies. Everybody, thank you for your time for joining today's call. Again, reach out to us for any further questions. We're glad to help. Um, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>